Yeah. You don't seem to be sure about a lot of shit. I'm pretty sure. Mm. I'll hold I'm my. Giving point. it a second to start the audio so oh. that we can get listeners. Broadcasting live, this is KMA Talk Radio, life, liberty, and the pursuit of fine cigars. With your hosts, Honest Abe and Adam K. the Brewmeister. Listen to the show anywhere in the free world at kmatalkradio.com. I like to smoke them like some Winston Churchill. Go ahead, Adam. Loyal listeners, libertarians, lovers of the leaf, everyone out there in Facebook land, welcome to another exciting edition of KMA Talk Radio, broadcasting live, uh, quarantine edition. I've lost count, because you know what? All the days, (laughs) they just run together, and I'm sure you all feel the same. Uh, We hope you're happy, we hope you're well, and we hope you're washing your hands. Thank you for joining us for episode number 382 of KMA Talk Radio. Wow, can you believe we've made it this far? Uh, We are very happy to have you with us this Saturday morning uh, in the month of June. Uh, With me, as always, the man, the myth, the legend, the man who needs very few introductions, Mr. Honest Abe himself. Good morning. Um, I think we can start calling it the quarantine edition, though. Okay. Well, uh, you know. Well, we're all in separate areas, so we've quarantined we ourselves. It's called KMA Remote. Remote. <laughs> I don't know. Quarantine just seems to have a better ring to it, I feel like. It's getting old. All right, fine. Easy, we'll, Paul. I'll find, <laughs> the producer. I'll find, I'll find a new word. What do you think, Paul? I'm, producer? I'm fine with not calling it the quarantine edition. I, I mean, we're going to be quarantined for a long time, so, uh, you know, it is what it is. Are we still under a quarantine? Is this called the quarantine? Our county is still technically under a quarantine, yeah. A partial we're, quarantine? We're only in phase a, one, so, yeah. Yeah, but it's technically not a quarantine, is it, anymore? Uh, I think so certain they're asking people, people have to, to stay home. They're asking people to limit their interaction with other people at this point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's Adam's I mean, daily way of life. Exactly. I was just going to say, it doesn't change anything for him. <laughs> I know. It's fantastic. I want, I love it. It's great. Not going to go wrong. Yeah, I'm not sure it's <laughs> quarantine edition. How was your week, Pauly? How was working at, from home yet another week? You know, it's it's trying at times. I'm not going to lie. I mean, we, you know how kids are, so they have good days and bad days. And, and yesterday happened to be a, a really rough day in this house. But I, you know what? When I really start to, like, like when I think about it, I think I w- I think I'm kind of lucky that I was able to be here uh, when the baby was born, be home to help this whole time. As as awkward as the whole situation was, it actually kind of worked out for us because the baby was born on the 29th of March, and you know I I was out of work two weeks before that. So you weren't even allowed like in the hospital, but like for like a few hours, right? So I was allowed in the hospital. I couldn't. At first, they said that depending on the height of the quarantine order, it was by hospital. Some hospitals weren't even letting the dads in the delivery room. All right. Um, we had friends up in New York that that happened to. I was allowed to be in the delivery room. I could not leave and come back or leave the maternity ward. Once at that you point, did, you couldn't had... come back. Correct. So I ended up leaving the, the day after the baby was born to come. And, you know, my parents had Axel, so I, I came and took care of him for a day before she came home. But even when I went to pick her up, I wasn't allowed to go in the hospital. So I had to wait outside. They brought her out. That's nuts. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a little weird, man. Cause last time I, I was going home at night to take care of the dogs and stuff, but that didn't happen this time. <laughs> my kids, but it worked out. My kids discovered Nerf guns this weekend. Oh, I saw that. Abe, I used to do that as a kid. The Nerf wars are the best. Dude, they had so much fun. I mean, it was, it was awesome. kind of, it was a great time. It was it was a little bit of a mess. Brandy locked herself in the bedroom. Literally, didn't come out. <laughs> for a couple, 
No, like literally it did not come out for a couple hours. What, she didn't want anything to do with it? She didn't want to be anywhere near getting hit accidentally. And then I, I'm pretty sure she didn't want to see like the, you know, 400 darts lying around every piece of <laughs> furniture, cup, glass, vase. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a good time. They got they got uh, Battle 2, I guess, scheduled this weekend. Ooh. Are you in the battle every time or are you like a ref? No, I kind of got my own gun, but I'm just kind of, I, I, I'm like a field reporter. I'm kind of like videotaping the footage and then putting it down and. You know, I want them to remember these moments, and you know, it was pretty. Oh yeah, pretty mm-hmm. fun. Yeah, we used to. Our our families both had basements when I, you know, when my cousins lived by us on Long Island, and we used to go in the basement and put like, you know, when they when when Spencer Gifts was big, when you had black lights. Yeah. We put like black lights. We'd hang our black lights in the corners from from our bedrooms, and then we would turn all the lights out, and and uh, we would have Nerf wars for like hours. It was yeah, we awesome. got. Some- 25 round like automatic and then you just come to realize i saw them i know but 25 rounds is not enough well you right. just gotta reload it once somebody shoots it you yeah to i know reload, it's not enough. go again we we used to have we used to have four round ones they, a gun that would have four if you got stuck with the single round one it was awful but yeah they we yeah. never had anything like that they have ones with chains like a like a Dude, gatlin gun i saw like a hundred rounds yeah and yeah you they carry it on your shoulder though. and walk around on your waist <laughs> Yeah, I saw it. Rambo like, style, like two hundred bucks or a hundred some bucks. Yeah, they're not. That stuff's not cheap. But it's it's. Listen, you get a lot of work. You get a lot of play out of them. They're uh, they're awesome. They had a great time. They had a great time. So it was fun. Adam, I'm pretty sure nothing exciting happened to you this weekend, this week at all. Nope. <laughs> nope. No. No. Take not at all. As no. 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 Very normal. You yeah. didn't even have like a good cup of coffee or anything? I'm having one now. Yeah. Very enjoyable. Right. I've been drinking some well, great coffee at home from our friend Kevin Perro, the commish. I know you said that. I got to try that. He, 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 he moderates a club called the Cigar Mil- New England Cigar Militia. And um, he sent me two bags, a Nicaraguan and a Honduran. And they're both good. Nicaraguan's a little more robust, mm-hmm. you know, but I'm, I'm like, I'm almost done with the whole bag of Honduran. It's a real good coffee. Hey. Good stuff. I, I like I like Nicaraguan coffee. I've been drinking that. Um, I'm gonna give you the the rest of the bag of the Nicaraguan I have then. That would be awesome. Yeah, I love it. It's it's a it's a more mild coffee, right? Nicaraguan. Yeah. <laughs> Not his. Compared to the Honduran, no. no? Out, out of the two, I find the Nicaraguan way more fuller. Okay. Yeah, I, I drink that that twin engine coffee a lot. That you know we had those guys on back in the day. Mm-hmm. That 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 honey bear. How's your uh, How's your plans for the trip, Paul? Are we still uh, Is it still on target to travel? We are not going to fly. I decided, and and I'll tell you why. Wait, wait. Getting okay. Okay, look, Steph decided. <laughs> no, okay, no, she on, didn't. Real. No. Come on, Paul. It's my call. It was my call. <laughs> Bullshit. We... <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I had something in my throat there. Oh. Listen, the big deal is that the flights that we're seeing that would be that are our flights on different days, they have to stop in BWI because we want to go to direct to Long Island instead of you know trying to avoid the epicenter of the of the uh, pandemic in Queens, going to JFK or LaGuardia, and to get a direct flight to any of those three airports, you know, let alone going outside of there, we'd have to go down to Miami. Um, and even then a lot of those flights are getting canceled daily and they're putting more, like they're not socially distancing airplanes anymore. I don't know if you know that. No, they're requiring you to wear a mask. So what they're doing is they're canceling flights, a lot of the major airlines and then packing, you know, the 15 people on each flight into one plane. So our friends, uh, flew up to New York and it was a full 140 or whatever it was that every seat was taken on the flight. Wow. We feel a little bit less comfortable with that with the kids, and then and everybody was wearing masks because they have to, and then uh, the flights that we were going to take, there's a stop at BWI in Baltimore, and we're just thinking, you know, when we get on the flight, normally we like, you know, take a, a sanit- sanitation wipe and we wipe down everything before Axel sits there because he, you know, he touches everything once the flight takes off, and uh, we're thinking, all right, we're going to have to do that on one plane. Then get off at BWI. The flight that we're taking or the time every day that we're taking has been delayed in BWI for another hour every day. So then we're going to be stuck in BWI for an extra hour with two kids and then and worrying about what they're touching, what they're exposed to. 
and then we got to get them on another plane, wipe down everything, and then get them to New York. We we have a bunch of stops because we have family that have all been quarantined on the way up to New York, so we're going to risk it and, and drive it. I think it's not the dumbest thing to do. I mean, I think it's a smart thing to do. I mean, you know, I'm not yeah. comfortable flying yet, to be honest. So it's just if it were just you, you would fly, though, right? Or maybe not. I don't know. You know, I found out this week my dad had it. Did he not know or he knew? And he well, didn't tell you when my uncle passed away and my other uncle and aunt were, were on the ventilators. Uh, he was sick. He had okay. a bad cough, bad congestion for weeks. Uh, you know, I would call him every day. He, he he was insistent that this is some allergy congestion that he gets annually. And that he, you know, he didn't have no fever. And uh, but he had a really bad cough and right. was congested literally that for two to three weeks. It was over huh. two weeks, it was like three or four weeks, to be honest with you. Right. Um, but uh, they at one point he did go get a chest X-ray. And they didn't say, you know, they obviously probably didn't have any major signs of having it. But he had been very, very ill. And uh, he got tested this week. And it ends up he has the antibody. So, yeah, he had it. Wow. He had it. And, you know, my mother my mother either never got it or got it was completely asymptomatic. Because she never showed any signs of anything. And during this whole time, they're sleeping in the same bed next to each other and oh, living geez. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my uncle passed away. None of his wife or kids had got it. My other oh, uncle was in, uh, in in the um, in the uh, on the ventilator for 23 days. His wife, three boys, and daughter didn't get it. So, you know, I, 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 I you know, I think it's it's it, you know, my dad's 75, 74, 75. Right. And um, you know, he's a little portly, and he's got a history of high blood pressure. And you know, knock on wood, I mean, just. Uh, you know, he didn't end up having to be hospitalized. He just got just kind of got through it, like having a bad cold. Wow. Well, all right. Yeah, I, mean, I just found out. And, yes. and there, it's and it's pretty. They're, they're up in Chicago, right? So yeah, it's yeah. pretty. All of them prevalent up there. Mm-hmm. It was one of the. It was one of the cities with a little more uh, activity than most. Right. Yeah. But well, yeah, good. that was Jeez, just news. But you know, I told him. I said, look, you know. Not all the tests are always accurate. Don't go out like a wild Bronco cowboy now. Acting like <laughs> you know, oh, I got it. I'm good. He's, I just told him, take it easy. Take your precautions still. Mitigate your risk. You know, but yeah, it was it was crazy. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough to decide. Like, it seems like they're kind of like letting us decide now. You know, like the officials don't. I mean, they're doing the phase one, phase two, phase three, but they're not like telling us what we can and can't do or what we should and shouldn't do. Well, right now. I, I think what's kind of kind of come to light over the last 20 days, 30 days, is that a lot of the initial findings weren't accurate, you know, because there's been now reports coming out of the CDC that it's not really transmitted by contact that easily and that, you know, um, there's a couple other things. They're, now they're saying that asymptomatic people are not contagious, you know, so a lot of it's changed. I mean, look, you can't expect them to know everything on the onset of it, right? So they're just going to make as much precautions as we would as people, as parents, right, of our own kids. Right. And then I think as they're starting to see that it, not all the data um, was on point in the beginning and some of the assumptions that may have been made, I just think they're just starting to loosen things up. And then there are cities that are still under complete lockdown, so. Yeah, that's... It is what it is. I mean, on Long Island, they're going to phase two when we get there. So that's that's what kind of made me feel a little bit more confident that that will be OK. And we're still going to be careful. And, you know, not everybody's going to get to hold the baby. Uh, you know, just the, our parents. At the bottom line, there'll be some sort and form of risk around for a long right. time. And all you could do is just try to mitigate your risk as much as possible. And that's, right. that's what you do. Yeah. No, that's that's all. I mean, we'll we'll figure it out. And I'm not looking forward to the drive, but there's there's about five hours between <laughs> each stop. I drive that we have. two babies. Yeah, it's going to be brilliant. Well, here's the other kicker that I didn't want to tell you. My wife wants to bring the dogs, too, because we're oh, be up there God, all like three please. weeks. Please yeah. bring the dogs. Please. I just want to see two toddler infant and a toddler and dogs in a car on a road trip. You have to video document this. Yeah. I will Wait. if we take them. 
Seriously, we have yeah. a new dog walker. We love them. They're they're referred by like two friends of ours that we wholeheartedly trust. But she she's like, if we're driving, we can take them. Listen, so I'm trying I, to. I can come and walk your dogs, but you don't trust me in your house. I I don't think you can walk my dogs. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, one. Okay. All right. You gotta first of all first of all my one dog is not good with other dogs. So when you're walking her, she's gonna go nuts and but she could probably pull you across the street. Two, what, what do you, you gotta, got? A bite deal for a dog. <laughs> you you gotta give her. You gotta give her Prozac. Prozac. You gotta give her Prozac every night. So you, and she doesn't like taking the pill. Give your dog Prozac. I you do. didn't know that. No, I did not know that. This has been going on for like eight months. Is that even not- legal to give a dog Prozac? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, it's it's prescribed by a. Vet behavioralist, which is one oh, of 50 in the country. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe we haven't talked about this. I've known about this for, like, forever. And I you thought we did about this, about Adam. It. Yeah. <laughs> what is the matter with you? So your I, dog has a vet behavioralist. Because his yes. dog's a little loopy. My dog has social issues with other dogs. And when we were having kids... We wanted to make sure that that aggression would not show itself around. What kind people. of dog is it? Pitbull I don't know husky. if I want to say on the air. No, well, she's a mix. We don't know for sure. We think okay. she might be a pit bull husky. So, so the answer was to feed the dog drugs. No, there were there were a bunch of other options. It cost me a lot is, more money actually that, like, I, that we what, did what, that we what, tried. What a lobotomy. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> She has anxiety. I, mean, what I can't is, believe we're friggin' talking this about even, this. Is this even PETA acceptable? Yeah, it's she has she has a social anxiety disorder. Like she, oh my God. dude, I don't want to get I don't want to get into this. <laughs> okay, All I right. was against it. We sent her away to a trainer that was supposed to like alleviate this. It spent. I, if I told you how much money I spent, you would you would never let me live it down. Uh, just before we got to the pills, the amount of money that I spent, I would. I mean, I could probably have more than half of a down payment on a car. You're so, nuts. I am nuts. I am nuts. Absolutely I love my animals. Causes. Yeah, me too. It's called training a dog. I've never met a dog that wasn't really trainable at some level. Stop. I've, I've had four different trainers. I've had four different... No, it's not owner. It, she she has like a, a mental issue. It's it's document. I have paperwork that shows like what her issues are. Can I just are. tell our fans right now because I know they don't see Willie Herrera, but Willie Herrera is cracking up <laughs> in his chair they right can now. See him. <laughs> I can see him. I can't tell. He's like cracking up. It's like the most absurd conversation I've heard. He's always wondering. He's like, when the hell do I come? Oh my god, is this guy crazy? I've seen this thing. <laughs> can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah. Can we? Yeah. yeah we can. Okay. So you know what? I I'm with you, Paul. My okay. wife's mom has a dog, a Yorkie, yeah. a miniature, I don't know what, that dog, they give it, uh, it's not pro- Xanax or something like that. Right. That's... Because that dog, it's got issues like the in the head. Beautiful dog, uh, you know, great to have puppies with, except for the fact that the brain is not all there, so you don't know if the <laughs> puppies are going to come out right or wrong. Is that her? Right. To... Yeah. This is her. Oh. Right. So, do you take her once a week to an office where there's a big like leather chair no. and the dog sits down? No, and dude. We took her. A guy we with took... a pad and paper and talks to the dog for like an hour. Okay, she's got to go. Go ahead, baby. <laughs> Listen, she's she's gone like maybe three times now, and she was observed, and she went away for three weeks to another different trainer that they recommended. Listen. I, I exhausted every effort. I was completely against giving her pills, but they help. So after after two years of spending thousands of dollars, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Let's give her pills. Yeah, let's just drug her so she's like out of it half the time. Oh, sure. stop. She's not out of it. People sure. take Prozac. It's the same pills that humans take. It's just a lower dosage. Although I kind of want to put her on a higher dosage. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever? Let me ask you just a roundabout question. Did you ever just like figure like giving her an edible? So I've thought about it. She's, she's, she's tried the, the um, uh, what do you call it, the CBD treats. Uh-huh. And her stomach is very sensitive, and she uh-huh. usually grows up after them. So I did, I did think about it. But if she's this, this anxious as a like, normal dog, I think that it might make her paranoid. All right, you well, know, like, 
not the pot to, makes you paranoid. Not to be the dead dog, but just, <laughs> she's alive and well. She's four it, years old. She's a good is girl. She, is she better? Did, did you see? Yeah, that? yeah. So it, she, it's. I mean, it t- it took a while because they. I mean, I I complained right away. I was like, this is crap. It's not doing anything. And the woman's like, it's just like people. It takes like six to twelve weeks to get through your system and whatnot. And yeah, I see a difference. She listen. She's not gonna go into the dog park and play with other dogs and not try to kill one of them. But but she is less anxious and nervous. It used to be you could drop a piece of paper on the floor. She freaks out, like terrified, running around, barking, scared. Wow. Now she, I mean, she doesn't like it. She just gets up and walks away. The kids come over to her and and grab her. She gets up and walks away. Have she doesn't tri- growl. Have you tried getting some cats? <laughs> I and have one calm, here. Calm, calm. Oh, that, those are scary. I so they're good luck. So I I took I Japanese in college and I was, I I bought a new one because I have some new business ventures going on. So I I wanted I have one that was given to me and I I bought this one for like the new stuff that I'm doing and I was like you know what I need the good luck. It was so. some bar either in some airport that I laid over through or it could be Vegas I can't remember but it, it was like a whole wall of them like a hundred of them. Different sizes. It was just eerie. Yeah. Just watching this it was just eerie. It was an eerie place. It was like, no way is, to uh, eat. words. Words of a words of one of our KMA listeners. Spending a lot of money on a pet doesn't make sense to me. They're not people. They don't live a long life. Alan Rubin, the other Alan Rubin. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, yeah. You better be Obviously, clear you on don't that. have pets. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't better, have pets. You better be clear <laughs> on that. A little bit. Yeah. Well, anyway, All right. enough about we me. We got a big show. <laughs> we got a big show. We have Willie Herrera here from True Estate. We're going to be talking about him, some new projects. There was actually a, a big announcement this week regarding a uh, the new a new release, the new version of the commemorative Dojo cigar, Dogma. Probably one of the the uh, second or third most famous small releases out there. I think out there, and. Um, Oh yeah. They they uh they uh well it's actually I mean actually it's an annual release but uh they're doing a sun grown version so we'll talk really about that and later on the show we're going to give some epic news on a very special launch party that they're doing for this cigar. So uh stay tuned throughout the show and we'll we'll get, we'll probably talk about that special uh, launch party in the second half of the show but I say let's bring Willie on and see what's yeah. going on. Absolutely. We KMA is pleased to welcome back Mr. Willie Herrera, master blender for Drew Estate. Willie started out his career in banking, but got into uh, working his cigar journey at El Titan de Bronze, making cigars by filling in for a sick in-law once upon a time. And now, at, through many years, Willie has been the master blender uh, from Drew Estate, has created a lot of great products, the Herrera Esteli, the Herrera Maduros. Willie, welcome back to KMA Talk Radio. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good to be here, man. How you guys doing? Oh, well, as you can already tell from the conversation, we are uh, trying to stay <laughs> sane as much as possible. Uh, what have hey. you been doing to try and stay sane during this time? Crazy times, man. You know, uh, definitely uh, picked up a few new hobbies. Oh, like uh, what? <laughs> well, got, got a lot more into the whole cooking. Okay. Gotten into the, the outdoor uh, planting of herbs and spices and trying to get a green thumb there uh you know and not to mention how techy i've uh had no no uh other choice but to get to learn you know uh i, I was uh, just barely able to get emails back in the day so now it's you know <laughs> zoom rooms and skype and teams and this and that and all kinds of different technological virtual <laughs> platforms and stuff so it's uh it's been challenging uh, it's a new world, without a doubt. Definitely. So, Willie, you, you, you now you have been operating under quarantine still, because I know I had a couple of meetings with the folks from Drew Estate, and they all seem to still be operating at home. Yeah, man, everything. Uh, I'm not gonna say it's the same, but yeah, everybody's pretty much doing their jobs uh, the same, as far as what the responsibilities are. Uh, just doing everything remote. A um, lot of virtual meetings. You know, I got to say, man, that's been one of the good things about these, uh, you know, quarantine times and everybody working from home is how much more we've been able to get done, man. Uh, you know, with us being on the road as much as we are all the time, it was very hard to schedule times to, to, to have meetings, everybody together, uh, all the right. different teams and stuff together. And now, man, we're able to 
set a time every morning. Okay, you know you're going to have this morning every day, this time. Everybody's on there. Uh, you know, we've been able to get a lot more accomplished, man, uh, compared to normal times of all of us just being on the road in different parts of the U.S. Oh, that makes uh, sense, actually. the country. Actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot less time. Yeah. Now, is, is this the longest you've been at home in oh. how many years? Oh, my God, <laughs> from the beginning, man. <laughs> from the beginning. I mean, from day one uh, that I joined Drew Estate, uh, I imagine the first year and a half I, I was living in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. So I was living in Nicaragua uh, Monday to Friday, go back to Miami to my family either Friday afternoon or Saturday morning, then go back either Sunday nights or Monday morning. That went on for a year and a half. And then after that, I was just on the road uh, promoting the release of Harris to Lee, uh, visiting as many shops as I could, as many events as I could. And, you know, that, that, that's continued ever since. Um, so, you know, this definitely by far is the longest I've been home and, and it's an adjustment for everybody, man. It's an adjustment, uh, for me, it's an adjustment for the kids seeing my, me uh, around so much. It's an adjustment for the wife seeing my face every day now. So it's been adjustment all around, man. How, uh, how often does your job require you to head down to Nicaragua? I go down <laughs> once a month. I'm in the factory once a month. Uh, whether it's working on new things or overseeing existing things, uh, looking at new, new new tobacco samples that were brought in. Uh, once a month, I'm down there, man. You know, you got to be. You got to be hands-on. Uh, we have a great team, and a lot of, a lot of the stuff they could handle. But I, I, like, I like being hands-on, and I like physically looking at uh, t- the tobacco, tasting the tobacco, smoking the production that's coming out, you know, uh, overseeing and seeing what, 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 what changes the, the new stuff that we're working on, you know, at the 30 day mark, the 45 day mark, the 60 day mark, uh, they could all be shipped over and whatnot, but I like being there, you know, and, and just hands on. But you haven't gone since, do you have any plans on going down there in the near future? Oh man, we still don't even know when we could get back on the road here. Local wow. our reps are still uh, uh, working remote, um, so we we have no idea as to when that's gonna you know that's gonna be lifted as far as for us traveling or whatnot. Uh, like like Paul was saying, you know it's it's a little concerning, especially now. I thought they were still doing the one seat yeah, one seat no thing on the planes. I didn't know that it was uh, wide open. Um, so I don't know. I don't know when. Well, that uh, was on that was on one airline that I know of for sure. Yeah. I, I guess I can call him out. It was on American. My Ooh, friend, and that's my one friend that was I fly on. Flight. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was no, on American. I'm not comfortable with that, man. So I don't know. You know, at what point I I'll be able to say, okay, I feel comfortable getting on and off planes. You know, on a, on a daily basis, like I like I would typically do, and you know, expose my kids, expose my wife, expose right. my grandmother her mother my mother i don't know man i don't know we'll we'll see yeah i'm not and to you, the point where i'm comfortable flying either you know and you have family in in Esteli still willie is your wife okay no 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 my family is all here uh okay. everything in 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 nicaragua is work related uh so when i was when i was living down there that's why i would fly back every week you know because i'm okay. okay. here in miami so um so yeah, man. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see uh, how this uh, goes changing and what new, you know, what new protocols they come up with. And like you were saying, Abe, now they're thinking a lot of stuff they said in the beginning really wasn't, you know, like that. And yeah, I don't know. It remains to be seen. Absolutely. Um, so how? Uh, how has communicating with the factory, like over Zoom and through all of this, been in trying to just keep production going and keep everything rolling as you've been, you know, stuck here in Miami and they're just trying to keep every day going? How has that worked out? Well, you know, that that part really hasn't changed much. So our production team, they're 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 in in Nicaragua, you know, so basically they've always relied on uh, the projections and numbers and stuff. Miami, U.S., and that would get sent 
you know, by email or uh, conversations or whatnot uh, from here over there that they knew, okay, we got to work on this this month, adjust the production plan based on, you know, the information being fed from the U.S. So it's not, it hasn't hindered anything as far as the, the, the travel over there on, on a production, on the production side. Uh, what has changed is, for example, we implemented a lot of the protocols that have been implemented in the U.S. in the factory. Mm-hmm. So, for example, now we have two shifts. In order to give the separation to the factory uh, rollers and the moncheros and the roleras right. over there, we've gone into two shifts. So now half of the factory, we're able to split out half the team. We're able to split half of the team into the whole factory by having two different shifts, right? Okay. Um, They're spreading out each shift. Exactly, exactly. And then we've cut down the hours a little bit. Um, we've also implemented, you know, every time the, the, the employees walk into the factory, before they even walk into the gates, they take their temperature. You know, they have, must have their gloves. They must have masks. All that stuff, everything is sanitized uh, constantly in the factory. So the production has gone down from 150, 160,000 cigars a day that we were producing to about 60, 70,000 cigars a day. Wow. So okay. a little bit more than half. Um, and then the other big thing is is the shipment of samples and stuff. So whether it's uh, packaging material going back and forth, that's been, that's been hindered uh, because there's, I think, only one flight, if that, coming out of Nicaragua now uh, for uh, cargo. Uh, there's still no American Airlines flights going into that. So if I wanted to go to Nicaragua, I wouldn't be able to go. Oh, so uh, you can't get there anyway? Yeah, no. Uh, so the cargo issue, you know, that was one. Uh, so samples of cigars, samples of packaging, samples of this, samples of that. Um, you know, that's, that, that's really the, one of the biggest things is, is it's really slowed down that. And then just the, 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 the way Nicaragua is working out, you know, uh, as far as getting boxes made and stuff like that. So everything's kind of slowed down, uh, in, in, in a whole, you know what I mean? In, in total, but you know, we're making things work, man. And, uh, we're trying to, uh, do the best we can. Now for some of li- yeah, well, we're all in that boat doing the best we can for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with your backstory how how did you eventually get into cigars so uh i was in banking um for about seven and a half eight years at, uh, before I, I made the, the choice or now what part of banking were you guys do were you doing i was well i started off as a teller uh when i was much younger uh at the point that i moved over to uh to the factory uh, to the tobacco world, let's say, cigar world. I was in loan processing, mm-hmm. working on loans, uh, personal loans, lines of credit, all wow. kinds of loan stuff. So uh, how I get in, uh, my family, my wife's family, had started the factory back in mid, mid to late, oh, yeah, mid-90s, 95, 96, around there is when they started uh, the cigar factory. You were already and, married. You were already married to your wife at this point. We had... Just, no, we got married in 96, so I believe the factory had been around already for about a year, year and a half. Okay. Uh, you guys, like guys were together. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we have been together. I mean, we were together since 89. Now, was, oh, that, wow. was that the El Titan de Bronze factory? Yes. Yeah, El oh. Titan de Bronze, which originally started oh. uh, at their liquor store. So they owned a liquor store in uh, in a, in Westchester, or Calle Ocho. Uh, the area is called Westchester. So... Uh, uh, it was in the, the, the height of the, that boom that everybody knows about in the mid-90s or whatnot. And so, you know, it was a very uh, busy, very big liquor store at the time. You know, you didn't have none of these chains. You didn't have the ABC, the Total Wines, all these big boys, you know. Right. So they were a, uh, a very, very busy. They had a huge selection of wines, a beautiful wine cellar, you know, all kinds of liquor, whatever. So... Everybody would always ask, man, how come you don't have cigars? Man, we want to buy cigars. Well, how come you don't have cigars? So she said, my mother-in-law said, you know what? Maybe that's another segment of the business. But because it was in that boom, she could not get cigars. She could not get cigars from any company. So one of the guys, one of the customers that would buy 
whatever it was he would buy all the time, was a retired cigar roller from Cuba. So they started the conversation one day, and he's like, sure, I'll come in and make a few cigars for you. She figured, hey, I got an ATF license, uh, tobacco, firearms, whatever. I'm, I'm a liquor store. Okay, I can make cigars. So the guy started out making cigars uh, in a little rolling table there in the, in the, in the liquor store. And every, I mean, he couldn't keep up. Oh, so then wow. he hired a friend and brought in another friend. And do that, everything they rolled, boom, it was gone because it was that boom. People couldn't get cigars. So eventually they moved on into a location. Um, well, before they moved on to the location, uh, a customer, ATF guy, uh, talks to my mother-in-law, Stan. He says, Danny, what are you doing? She's like, what? I'm making cigars. He's like, you can't make cigars. You have to have a license to make cigars. But I have a tobacco license. That's ATF great. license, right? Not the same and license. The guy's like, no, you can't, you know, whatever. So, oh, okay. So then she does the whole thing, whatever. And that's when they moved to an actual factory. Uh, location and open the factory and so they started how making cigars how many pairs did they have when they opened do you know well so remember in 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 the u.s and cuba they don't work in pairs well in cuba they don't work in pairs and the way we work here in the u.s is the same as in cuba they don't work in pairs it's the roller bunches of cigars in the morning at the end of the day pack the wrapper them. right so in nicaragua dominican honduras that's where you have that the whole pairs thing which was that was totally new when I came up to Jewish. I'm like, what do you mean this guy rolls him and then somebody <laughs> else puts the wrapper on? That doesn't compute in my head, right? Now, while, while your but, mother-in-law, while your mother-in-law is growing this business, right, and 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 now getting deeper in the cigar business, you're just a cigar smoker at this point, right? Just yeah, just enjoying an occasional, you know, a cigar here and there. Oh, not occasional, man. I mean, shit, I was smoking cigars from I don't know, fifteen, age of fifteen or sixteen. You know, whatever I could buy at the cafeteria when I would go buy my uh, the little ball of dough before they pumped it in, before they put it into the oven to make the Cuban bread. You know, there was a little place by my house you could buy a little ball. They were given a Ziploc bag. And, and I, mean, I would go fishing in the canals with, right? Uh -huh. and then I'd pick up, you know, twenty five cents, thirty five cents, whatever. You know, those cheap, cheap bundle cigars that they have at cafeterias because I was always big, so they never really questioned me. That's <laughs> funny. Give me two or three of those or whatever. And that, so that's what I enjoyed, right? I didn't who know gave, anybody. Who gave you your first cigar? Oh, nobody, man. I would buy them. I would buy you them just, at the cafeteria. On your own, said, this is something yeah. I want to try. That's yeah. Funny. Huh. Well, because I would see my, on uh, my father's side, his uncle or great or great uncle, some, some old man, uh, lived with a cigar in his mouth. Right. I mean, 24 hours a day, whenever you saw the old man, it either it was lit or he was chewing on it. Right. <laughs> I, I know smell, I know through those guys, yeah. That smell to me, man, at a very young age was, old, was always just, wow, that smells so good, you know? And so at 15, 16, man, I would buy these cheap things uh, at a cafeteria because I couldn't walk into a shop, right? And I would, I, I would smoke that out fishing man you know and get on my bike and hop around all the different canals or whatever and smoke you know so <laughs> i was in banking right and now the factory's up and running and the ones that were running at full time was my wife uh, my mother-in-law's parents so my wife's grandparents uh and he was actually the only male figure in the factory uh, at that point, you know, the, the, my, my, my mother-in-law had, had gotten separated, whatever. So it was her and her parents running the factory. Then she starts working at another job uh, that had been offered to her. So now it's, the factory is left with her parents, so elderly people, the grandmother and the grandfather. So the grandfather gets sick. They needed a male person there. I took a week off of vacation from the bank, worked a full week there, and just fell in love with it. You know, up to that point, I had always been just a cigar smoker, knew nothing about the culture, knew nothing about the consumers, knew nothing about tobacco, knew nothing about cigars. Other it beat, than it beat rejecting oh. loans, huh? <laughs> Brother. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's what I tell people all the time, man. It's, it's always pissed off people in the bank. Yeah. You know, <laughs> on the teller, my, why is there a hold on my check? What do you mean you're going to hold it for, you know, oh. seven days? 
uh, when is this going to click? Oh, man, it was always a problem, always a problem. And, you know, that week working in the factory, everybody was happy. Everybody came in, was in a good mood. It was a good conversation. It was just awesome, man. I was like, oh, dude, no, wait a minute. I'm, I'm done. I, <laughs> this is my new, this is my thing now. And that's when I started learning uh, about the whole cigar industry, uh, learning about tobacco, learning about cigars, learning, you know, the different regions, just learning everything. Uh, it, it, it's, that's when it started, man. Uh, so they asked started, you to come in, they asked you to come in, you started helping. What was your early roles early on? I mean, it wasn't bl- rolling and making cigars. You were just processing no. loans last week. It, it, it was helping people that will walk in, you know. So we're in Little Havana, right? Right. And it's a very touristy spot. Um, and at the time, there was, geez, there was at least 10 factories in Little Havana. Cigar factories. Oh. So, you know, we had La Gloria Cubana, uh, Ernesto Pérez Carrillo, across the street from us. Right next to them, you have uh, El Rey de los Habano, which is now my father, Pepin Garcia. Uh, he was next to them. You had La Tradición Cubana, a block down from that. You, I mean, right. you, and they went on and on and on. So we had a lot of walk-ins. We had a lot of people, you know, visiting cigar factories on layovers, uh, people that were coming in to get on a cruise ship. So they came in a day early. They wanted to load up on their cigars. Uh, or just people coming down to Miami, you know, and... If, for the sole purpose of visiting all the cigar factories, man. Mm-hmm. And so it was just talking to people, all the walk-ins, man, talking to all the walk-ins and, and, and selling cigars, selling our, our, our product. And, you know, I was smoking what I was smoking at the time, the type of cigars that I was enjoying at the time, which weren't the ones that we were making. The ones that we were making weren't <laughs> for me. It, it, they just didn't hit me right. I wasn't a fan. So, I'd smoke everything I would buy. And, uh, you know, for a while, the old man, so the old man eventually comes back, and, you know, he's seeing me smoke all these cigars other than El Titan the Bronx cigars. And so the question, hey, why are you smoking this? And, hey, why aren't you smoking, well, you know, this one? And why aren't you smoking? And so on. It, be, it became a problem. And I realized it became a problem, so I said, okay. I gotta, I gotta have these guys make a cigar for me. I have to, I need to have something here, made here that I'm gonna enjoy. So every day I would hound one of the rollers, hey, do this with this, and I like this, and change this wrapper and this and that. And that worked for a few weeks, you know, but you have to remember these guys get paid by how many cigars they roll. So it became then an issue where these guys either had to start coming in early to make their quota for the day or stay home, uh, stay uh, at work late before going home in order to meet their quota for the day. And then that became an issue. So I'm like, oh man, okay, you know what? I'm going to learn how to make a cigar. I'm going to make this thing myself. So I taught myself how to bunch, how to fill the molds, you know, by staring at them. And then I go back to my little station in the back and try to mimic what they were doing and try to learn how to make something smokable. You know, how to put enough leaves on that mold for that particular Vitola that at the end it wouldn't be too tight or it wouldn't be too loose. And eventually I learned how to make cigars. And that's when the whole blending thing started. Uh, Just went to town every day. Just let's use this binder. Let's use two different binders. Let's use this wrapper with this binder. Let's swap out. Let's not put any seco. Let's just do straight viso ligero. Okay, let's not put viso. Let's put ligero and seco. Just make combinations and just make create stuff without knowing what the hell was going to happen because I didn't <laughs> know all the components of what these tobaccos were going to taste like and how they burn. Was it going to burn? Was it going to burn? You know, it, it was just, it was a game for me. And it was so exciting to, you know, be a chemist, basically. And, and just play, put these dry leaves together, and make it taste like something. And how, long, the- how long did it take for you before you actually made something that was smokable for yourself? It was a while. As far as a cigar or a blend? Uh, both. So you had both, right? It, it took a while to even be able to, to get a cigar out of those initial molds that I was learning how to bunch 
Mm-hmm. That wouldn't be. Oh shit, man! This is so tight that <laughs> I can't draw right. Or it was like, oh no way, this is underfilled, right? So that took I don't know four months, five months, something like that. And then after that, I would say another six to seven months before I would smoke. I said, oh man, this is actually pretty good. And then I would, I would write everything down. So then I would look at what I had written down for that cigar compared to all the other older blends. And I would say, oh, well, man. Okay, so this binder doesn't work too good with this wrapper. Or this binder with this filler isn't working out too good. And I kind of started learning, you know, okay, let's use these seckles or let's not use these seckles or these vessels work well. And it was just a learning thing, man, that it was just trial and error. It was trial and error. Everything was what, trial and error. Was know? anybody was anybody a mentor to you or influence you or help you? Did you have anybody to go to advice or this is just I, all on your own? Well, I I as far as looking up to, uh, I was always a huge huge fan of Pepin, Pepin Garcia. So you know, no one no did one you really. Down, did you go down to Kai Ocho and watch him make cigars and be like, you, you know? know <laughs> every factory, man, and even in Nicaragua, you know, everybody's very protective of what they do, what they create, what their blends are, or whatnot. So nobody, nobody's, that's like that information, nobody's really going to, hey, this is how you do, and this is how you blend stuff, right? Because nobody's going to give away their secrets. It's like a chef. Right. Or, or fishing. I mean, it happens to me all the time, man. You're, hey, man, dude, killer catch. Where'd you catch? Oh, it was right out there. <laughs> Nobody tells you to fish. Nobody tells you where the snappers are biting. Nobody tells you where the tarpons are at. Nobody tells you where to look. So it's kind of similar with cigars, right? Nobody really wants to give away their recipe. Nobody wants to give away their secrets. So I had people I looked up to because I was a big fan, am a big fan of what they create. Um, so I had that. And other than that, it was it was on my own. Uh, you know, occasionally the our rollers would walk by and say, oh no 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 no, place your leaf like this and hold the wrapper, put the, the wrapper like this on the table and position it like this or whatnot. But that was pretty much it, man. Everything else was trial and error and 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 see what worked and what didn't work. And then because we're in Little Havana and all those walk-ins were coming in, I used that as kind of my platform for my feedback. So you had a lot of people, obviously, oh, yeah, I'm looking for a cigar for my boss. Or, yeah, I want to take a cigar back for, you know, so-and-so. Uh, but then you had a lot of people coming in saying, okay, well, what's the filler on this cigar? What's the wrapper? Oh, what binder are you using? I was like, oh, okay, this guy knows a little bit more. This guy's more of a smoker. This is for him. So then I would give some, I would go to the back uh, right before they walked in. I said, hey, hold on, man. Let me give you something. I would love to get your feedback. Uh, and I walk into the back, grab one of the sticks that I had worked on. Here you go. I just want you to let me know. Week, two weeks from now, let me know what you, thought, what you think about the cigar. Huh. And that's how it all started. And then what that eventually led to was a lot of cigars. Uh, of those uh, sticks that I gave out to people becoming house cigars for a lot of shops, which we still make today. You know, we make cigars in in Pennsylvania for shops, cigars in Arizona for shops, cigars, just cigars all over for, for, for uh, different shops that are their house. You said, you you said that we still make today. Do you still feel attached to the factory? It's family, man. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. I'm glad. I know, it was a great and, and, and you know, with Jewish State being how Jewish State is, you know, Jonathan, the first thing he always says is Sandy and El Titan the Bronze and where Willie got his start and how I stole Willie from El Titan the Bronze. <laughs> you know, they've never uh, shied away from bringing to light El Titan the Bronze where I, where it all started for me. And because of that, and because of how they are, I mean. We got the Herrera Miami, Herrera City Miami. That started off as a as a uh, limited edition coming out of El Titan the Bronze. So I was able to go back to the roots, go back to my factory, and work there uh, in creating this blend. 
And then they decided, okay, you know what? This is doing great. We're going to do a full line of that. So now I have a whole line that, I, that I'm overseeing. And Well, that's the Habano, the original. And then the Miami is the one with the black and gold uh, band. And now that one's a full line. So now you have all five sizes available in that one. Um, so, and on top of that, now I'm working on a new Miami limited edition that's going to be coming out as well. So, you know, it, it's all family. Drew Estate well, is part of El, uh, of El Tyan, and El Tyan is part of Drew Estate. It's all one big thing. That's a great way to have it, and that's actually a great segue for our part yeah. two of our show. Uh, when we get back, we're going to dive into Willie's uh, development to, yeah, and, and formation within the Drew Estate organization. We got some KMA questions about some new blends. I'm told to ask you about your flan. And of course, <laughs> and of course, uh, we're going to have the big announcement on the uh, newest commemorative dojo release, the Dogma Sungrown, and a very special uh, launch party that we'll be having all coming up in part two of KMA. So now just a quick word from our sponsor. Hey everyone, Susan Giorgio here. Hi, this is Rich coming at you from South Florida. Hi, I'm Tom Stroud. Hey, it's Stephen Martin coming to you from Seattle, Washington. Hey everybody, I'm Jennifer True. Hey everyone, this is Alex Ryan. I'm a poker player, a dominoes player, a world traveler. I like to go sailing, hit the golf course, and drink some wine. I am a mother, I am a content creator. I'm also a husband, a father, and someone who really enjoys great cigars. Enjoying a Monte Cristo. In fact, the 50th anniversary Monte Cristo, special limited edition. My favorite cigar, Monte Cristo Epic. Please take this opportunity to smoke one of our amazing Monte Cristo cigars. The Monte by Monte being my personal favorite. I am Monte Cristo. I am Monte Cristo. I am Monte Cristo. We, we are, are Monte, Monte, Monte Cristo. Cristo. Welcome back to KMA Talk Radio, broadcasting live in the segmented version on Facebook Live. I am Adam K., the Brewmeister. Welcome back. We hope you've enjoyed the first hour of the show. With me, of course, Mr. Honest Abe. Hello, hello. Paul, the producer. Hi. And show's, actually, heard... show's actually going pretty smooth this morning, Paul. I know. Way to go, yes. Paul. Hey, good job. Golf clap. Well, you're not watching the live feed, so it looks smooth. I am watching, <laughs> I am watching the live feed. Oh, uh, crap. Golf Ball, <laughs> uh, and of course our uh, meet your maker for this week, uh, master blender for Drew Estate, Mr. Willie Herrera. Willie, once again, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to be here. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Glad to All be right. here. Now, uh, I believe we've got a couple of KMA yeah. ask KMA questions. Uh, Let's problem those up before we get into a deep dive. Go ahead, Adam. No, um, you know, I got him. So listen, first <laughs> off, we need to ask you about this flan. What's this flan oh. I keep seeing coming up? Ask Willie about his flan. Uh, I don't industry? know, man. It's, uh, you know, or flan. A, a lot of, a lot of people that know me, you know, know me for two things. I love food and I love the outdoors, uh, whether it's out on a boat, uh, or out getting muddy on an ATV with the kids and the family or out in the kitchen, just creating stuff. Now, uh, contrary to a lot of belief, it's not like I know how to cook. It's a lot of printing recipes and then going by the recipe. Uh, so, but I love doing it. it. It relaxes me. But when it came to the flan, you know, I remember at a young age, my mom and my grandmother making flan, but it was very, you know, you use this and you use this and you do it like this. And they were great, but, and I guess the whole cigar blending thing kind of played a role in it. I, I said to myself, well, man, if I add a little bit more of this, or if I add a little of this, it'll, it should do this. You know, and mm -hmm. so I did, and uh, and it comes out like really, really good, uh, really creamy, really sweet. I mean, <laughs> it's just stupid good. And uh. so, uh, you, a few years ago, we were at an event, and uh, you guys know Frank Pereira, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, yeah. so he was there, he's uh, been on the show actually, okay, so he was there, uh. Who else was there? It was like, it was a group. It was maybe six, seven guys at the table that night. And the flan conversation came up and uh, somebody said, well, we should have a flan cook-off. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Uh, so they picked the location. A flan cook-off. That's pretty masculine there. Oh, yeah. 
Dude, listen. And so we set a day. Everybody, everybody was supposed to cook a flan and bring the flan to the location. Well, when I show up with my little flan, right? Everybody else had bought their flan or brought in multiple flan. So now all of a sudden they got they got more opportunity than I did. I was like, okay, cool, no problem. So we went into the store. They had set up a long, uh, long table, numbered one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the flan. They gave a piece of paper to everybody waiting outside and said, "Okay, go in and try and write in a piece of paper the number of the flan you like best." And they picked my flan. Uh, so I beat out the guys that have bought in uh, multiple flan or, or, or uh, you know cooked multiple bl- uh, flans or whatever to my one little flan. So ever since then, you know, I bring it to the fact uh, to the office every once in a while, and everybody just goes nuts. Anytime guys from the office come to the house, what well, you got? Are you gonna make flan? That's the only thing I want. Billy <laughs> Herrera, the flan king. <laughs> right. I might be out to something after the cigar business, man. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Willie Willie Herrera, uh, Willie Herrera's flan restaurant. Right. <laughs> or, or flan around. Food truck, man. You never right? know. <laughs> flan food truck. Hey, maybe you guys could get a thing going together. Chrissy Critchfield saying. Well, maybe it's not as manly as a, as a jerk-off, Abe, with your jerky, but maybe you guys can sell the jerky and the flan in the same it, cigar truck listen, and, let's and just, have a couple cigars in there. Wait, let's just be real. Is anything more manly than a jerk-off? <laughs> Come on, Chrissy. That's about as manly as it gets. <laughs> uh, so we had another question about uh, Cameroon wrapper. Do you have any uh, intent of using Cameroon wrapper in the future? They, at all, seem, to be, they seem to be hard-pressed about a Cameroon project. Yeah. Well, you know, I've I've always loved that rapper, man. Uh and I'm how I, I'm always hounding our our key uh tobacco guru, uh Nick Van Olden. Uh and I'm always asking him, can you get me Cameroon? Can you get me Cameroon? Cameroon is probably the hardest tobacco to get good Cameroon. Um and extremely expensive extremely bad yields but it's i'm also, still hounding it's them. also fragile right it's very oh, fragile man, that's, that's why the yields are so bad it's yeah just such a fragile it's, wrapper. it's even fragile after the production i find yeah. it a lot it's yeah. uh, listen back when i mean i don't know what is this 15 maybe 18 years ago like cameroon or 19, 20 years it was, it was like the hottest rapper out there i mean every every cigar that was on fire in the market had a cameroon version and the cameroon sold extremely and I just, you know, I, I, I like a Cameroon wrapper. I mean, it's, 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 it's oh, definitely me too. My, my palate and profile, especially when it's blended with a great blend. But it's the wrapper that if, if I just put the cigar on the table too hard, it'll crack the wrapper. I mean, it's just yeah. it's a very fragile wrapper. Yeah. Yeah, that was way before my time. Uh becoming master blender uh, of the company. Um, but yes, they had that out there for, it, it was it, it was short-lived, I want to say. I think it was a few years that that line was out. Um, but as, I, as I understand as of right now, a regular production line with Cameroon, I don't believe we have, uh, I could think of. I don't think, I, is this crazy? I don't, I can't remember having a Cameroon wrapper. Ah, uh, yeah, you have, and you probably didn't know it. Maybe I didn't realize. Yeah, you I'll have. have to go through my. I'll have to go through my humidor and see if I have anything. I'm pretty sure you have. Yeah, so I'm a so, fan. So definitely, at some point, we'll see something with Cameroon. Good. I'm okay. A, I'm a fan too. So, you mentioned being master blender in 2004. Yeah, yeah, for Drew Estate, which I believe was about what 2014. Yes, I believe that's when okay. it made me master blender. How did how did that evolve, right? So here you're working in a in a factory in Kyocho. You guys are building somewhat of a reputable name. You're not only got people coming down, you've got retailers starting to put your cigars in the store. How did the meeting happen with Jonathan Drew to the point where eventually you left your family's business and started working with Drew Estate? So while in the factory in Miami and at Titan the Bronx, you know, we started off as like you just said, a, a lot of cigars are private labels or house cigars for a lot of shops. Then that that craze uh, 
uh, happened of Miami boutique cigars. I remember in oh. Six, maybe the uh, cigar aficionado had an article of Little um, Little Havana or something like that, and they featured there the Padilla and the Eleven. They featured their Pete's uh, Brown Label. Uh, they featured, I believe, the El Rey de los Habano uh, from Pepin Garcia. You know, this whole craze happened with Miami-made cigars, boutique cigars, and so a lot of people then started coming over to Little Havana to have a Miami-made cigar. And a lot of those ended up at all time. So one of the early one, early on uh, brands that we worked on, uh, you guys all know Sean Williams. He's with yeah. General now, the face yeah. of Cohiba. Mm-hmm. Well, he yeah. had his brand back then, uh, mm-hmm. Primer Mundo cigars. And they were made in Nicaragua by Placencia. And then he wanted a boutique, and I met him at a trade show. We started talking. He wanted something made in Miami. And we just started then this lifelong relationship, uh, which today he's one of my closest friends. Um, And we did the Liga Miami uh, for him. And that was, I would say, the first line existing brand, uh, not new guy coming into the industry, uh, that I worked on. And then from there, I did two more lines for him. I did a line for Nest, um, for Nestor uh, Miranda, uh, the Casa Miranda Chapter Two, I believe it was, it, oh, wow. it was called. I did that, and so you know, it just started going from there. And at the same time, the blog world was coming on. Uh, you know, a lot of these sites where people were talking about cigars and reviewing cigars, all these forums. And I guess, you know, John was started seeing my name, seeing my name, hearing these brands, the, the reviews that these cigars that I was creating and whatnot. And so, you know, in 2009, I think it was 2009, we started talking, hey, what do you think about coming on to Jewish State and kind of doing what you're doing in, in your family's factory in Jewish State? You'll have your own little team. You'll train them how you have your guys rolling your stuff in Miami. It'll be boutique. It'll be small batch type stuff. And, and that's where it started, you know? So I made the, the, the or I should say maybe my, my family made this decision for me, packed my bag and said, you can't miss out this opportunity. Get out of here and go. <laughs> and it's uh, the best thing that ever happened, you know, because it just opened so many doors, not only to me, uh, but to then our, my family and my family's factory here as well. Um, and it's been, it's been, been amazing, man. It's been a great ride. So far, so good. I can't complain one bit. Wow. No, it's been an can, amazing ride. What do you can want to I say ask a question? Because yeah. I, I, I feel like maybe, maybe this is a, a question for Adam and Abe that they, that, that they would already know the answer to. But I would assume the majority of even, even what Allison calls cigar nerds wouldn't know this. But like, Willie, when you start to to create a, a blend for for a line, what what is it? One, how does it start? Like, does somebody come up with an idea for you know we want this type of cigar, or do you just say I have this blend that I've been working on that would make a really great that has made a really great cigar? And then how long does it take from when you start the blend? Usually, typically, I know it's probably all different till when it's actually like being produced. Well, I'll answer the first two questions first. And uh, and it's kind of the same answer for both questions. So okay. so it works two different ways. As a company, we're always looking at what we have. We look at gaps in our portfolio. Right, for example, right. on the crown shade. At that time, you know, we never had a Connecticut shade milder cigar in that in that wheelhouse. So they said, hey. We want to. We want you to work on something mild. We want something Connecticut shape. Okay. Okay. So that's one route. I went into it knowing, okay, I want something. It's got to be like this. Right. Use Here's the profile I'm looking for. Now, the second part is every month I'm in Nicaragua. Every month I'm working on stuff. And. Do we lose him? Lose Willie. What a face, too. Look at that lock. That is 
Wow. That, this is our first freeze out well, in the KMA Remote Edition. First freeze it, ever. He'll, he'll I, be back. Uh, when you no start oh, he's back. a project, he's back. when you start uh, the blending process, you know, you got to remember, in, right off the bat, you're looking at 45 to 60 days. Um, and that's just the time that you're going to wait while a cigar is aging in the cool room before you can smoke it and see what it's going to taste like. Um, now, if it's no good, then you got to start all over again and wait another 45 to another 60 days. Um, so that process at a minimum, you're looking at 60 days, just the blending process to see if it's going to be good at the end of those 60 days. If now you got to start all over again. And now that's just the creative part of the cigar. Then right. you go into the packaging and the story and how where it's going to fit and all that. And that could be a year, two years, three years, you know. So, so it's, a, it's a lengthy process. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so definitely. As you're going to Nicaragua once a month or as you were, how many samples or are you bringing back with you after that, you know, one month trip? Yeah, if you didn't understand that question, I didn't either. Yeah, I'm. Um, oh, uh, yeah. How, how many again, cigars are you bringing back with you that are test blends? That are you bringing back after you after you go to Nicaragua? You probably that, test them there, Adam. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, I, I, a, I didn't get. I couldn't hear the majority of thing. I don't know if it's me, but it was cutting out real bad all of a it's sudden. It's okay. You were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you were lucky. If I, if I had a big gong, I'd be hitting it right now. So yeah, you 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 were. You were lucky. He was just asking if you if you take a bunch of 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 the test blends back with you when you come back, or do you test them there Both. at the factory? Okay. Both. So when I'm at the factory, I'm I'm going through the stuff I did the the month prior and the month before that, uh, or I look at stuff from six months ago. You know, um, in cig cigars and tobacco, it's weird, man. It's not there isn't a manual. Uh, and it's not necessarily true that at the 45-day or 60-day mark, the switch is on right. and, and the cigar is good. Now, Sometimes right, right. it happens that it's 90 days. Now, there's another thing that I've commonly heard, and I want to know what your take is on this. Because actually, it's things I've heard from some of the former Jewish State people. But when you work on a blend in Nicaragua, and you finished it all up, and it's been at 60 days, and they're ready to smoke and try do you smoke them in Nicaragua or do you smoke in the States? Because what I've heard is they want to smoke them in the States because they believe that something happens in transport that affects the flavor. And very often blends that they've created in Nicaragua, by the time they get it here in the States, doesn't quite taste the same. So in order to know what it's going to be like by the time it gets here in the States in the cell, they try to only sample cigars after they've been exported. Now, do you, right. is there any merit to that or what's your feeling on that see that's complicated i'll tell you why so any cigar you smoke is going to taste a little bit different depending what it is that you're doing right what 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 that what those circumstances are are you sitting in a beach overlooking the ocean are you sitting under a palm tree are you sitting in an office are you sitting on a mountainside with the view of a river like you would be in Nicaragua? Uh, are you up in a cabin somewhere? Um, so that experience when you're there and you got tobacco all over you and you're inside of a factory and you smoke tobacco everywhere you go, you know, that cigar is going to taste a little bit different when you're in the factory. Mm -hmm. Now, you take that same cigar, you package it, you send it to the state. A few things happen in that, in that transition of it getting to the States. One is the amount of humidity that cigar is going to go through, being put in a container, getting shipped two, three hours to the port, sitting in that port, then getting it over to the United States, or getting it on a plane, getting it off the plane and smoking it, you know, right off the bag, uh, right off the bat, right when you land. Because that has happened to me. So I've had cigars where I had smoked all week in Nicaragua. I brought samples back with me in my backpack, lit one up 
in my car and it did taste different. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you got the whole elevation thing, the pressure, the humidity, dry, whatever, all these different things. But that cigar after a week sitting in my humidor, it tastes just as good as the one that was smoked in Nicaragua. Um, I think it's more of that that transition part, whether it's being, you know, trucked over to the port and everything it goes through, going over to the port and then being put in that ship and that ship making over to here. Um, we're even putting it on a plane and smoking right out right the minute you get out of a plane. Uh, it is going to smoke a little different. It's, it's, you know, there's no doubt about that, you know. But at the end of the day, that cigar, after a week or two, it goes back to, you know, tasting how it's supposed to taste. For me, in my opinion, that's been my experience with everything. Interesting. So you believe it's you believe also it has a little bit of psychology has to do with it, the setting. Absolutely, I think so. I, I think know. so. That would make sense based on the the manufacturers that have told us that. <laughs> I think so. You know, yeah, man. Look, I tell people all the time, I never sleep better than when I'm in Nicaragua. And I've seen that quote. I've seen that quote. I'm six foot five, 250 pounds. The beds in Nicaragua are not meant for guys like me. They're much (laughs) smaller beds. They're they're, they're not pillow top beds. Okay. But I sleep better there than I do in any fancy hotel in Las Vegas or any hotel in the U.S. What do you attribute that to? Climate? Oh, it's just where you're at, man. just the, 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 the beauty of Nicaragua, the calmness of Nicaragua, the, the views you have from where our, our factory is located, the birds chirping, you know, the cows walking behind the factory every once in a while moving. Uh, look out your window and, and you're seeing mountains and you're seeing a, a little stream behind you. It's just, just where you're at, man. You know, I don't know if the altitude plays a part to that too, the air. I think it's everything. I think it's everything. I literally, I cannot go to sleep anywhere without having the TV on. I have to have the TV on. Even if my eyes are closed, I have to have it on. I, I'm the same way. Now, let me ask you a question because Paul you know, has issues with this. How does your wife handle that? Because my wife can't stand that. It, well, she's used to it now. I mean, we're, we're, yeah. we've been married now 20, what, 24 years or something. Um, so she's kind of used to it now. Uh, it was an issue in the beginning. Uh, it was a serious issue in the beginning, but she got used to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but too. the reason for, for making that point is I go into my room in Nicaragua, no TV. I yeah, look down, no. and I'm out. I'm out. I don't wake up the, during, during, during the night. It's just it's crazy, man. It's nuts. <laughs> and I can't explain it other than it's just being where you're at, man. I, I, can, I can attest to that, except I learned to sleep without the TV on. <laughs> do it I, I can't do it either i gotta watch tv till i go to bed till I pass and it's out. not even about watching it i mean it's no sound on and hearing it yeah i can't for me complete silence is almost disturbing right yeah. and it's not it's not sound that wakes me up because if the tv is blasting i can sleep a lot it's a change of sound mm-hmm. right if the tv is mm-hmm. blaring and i'm asleep and you come in the room and shut off the tv that will wake me up yeah right? yeah yeah right it, or, yeah. or, or, you know, or it's TV's, happened to me. Right. Or the TV's loud, but something's louder. That will wake me up. If that TV's a constant, it's like a lullaby. Dude, listen, it's happened to me where I've been like somewhat half asleep at home. My wife looked, oh, okay, he fell asleep. Boom, she turns it off. Why'd you turn off right? the TV? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Wait, wait, Willie. Willie, you want to know what the best response is when they do that? You go, Hey, I was watching that. Oh, yeah, exactly. I was just resting my eyes. <laughs> I was watching that. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, any, uh, well, we, we got Coop coming on today? Yeah, Coop's, Coop's ready to go when we're ready for him. Yeah, let's bring him on. Let's see what's got going on. All right. Adam, you don't have that problem, I guess, with your wife. Wa- oh, wait. That's right. There, there's no wife. <laughs> oh, Adam, do you oh. sleep at the TV? Do you hey, sleep with the TV on? No. I have money that Adam sleeps with the dog. Do you? Don't lie. No Don't way. Lie. Yes, look at the silence. Silence is admittance. Look at that. Do you snuggle? Do you snuggle it's on night? not even movie? his dog. Doesn't matter. He's bonded, dude. He loves that. I've seen him I've seen him show more affection for that dog than any. Look, it's he's trying to show it's his screen. Isn't 
It's his lock screen on his phone. Uh, no, you can't see it. It blurs out. Just, oh, it just blurred out. Okay, you know, that was yeah. the dog sleeping next yep. to me. Yes. Yep. I, I've seen Adam. I, I, the only humane, human emotion I've ever seen him express in I don't know how many years we've been working together was toward that dog. <laughs> it is it is weird. He sends me pictures of it all the I'm time. I'm telling you, you he love loves dogs. dogs. I'm trying. I lo- I do love dogs, but it just seems weird you showing emotion towards any other <sighs> being. Have you? Well, he doesn't just to his dog. Yeah. Have you Have you had a dog before? Oh yeah, I know. I had a dog growing up, and like okay. like it was the family dog, but the dog loved me more than everybody else. You can call my mother and ask; <laughs> she'll tell you the exact same thing. The dog was well, the only person that understood you. Exactly. Right, yeah. What what was wrong with the dog? Did, was it on Prozac too? No, it was not. The dog definitely is Prozac. What happened to the dog? Because this could be why you're screwed up. Maybe something traumatic happened to the oh, dog. Oh no, no, the dog died, and I got an email about it. Oh, you were living here. You haven't heard this dog death story? I think we've talked about it on camera. I think we have. Yeah. No, I. Uh, yeah, oh, we maybe went up before it. me. Yeah. No. Email. It was great. Yeah. He <laughs> was traumatized. Anyway, uh... Well, you abandoned the dog anyway. You didn't take it with you. Oh. I couldn't! Oh. God, did you go there? I'm just you know saying. I'm done talking to you, Paul. Let's let's bring on let's, Cooper. Let's talk to our good buddy, Mr. William Cooper. Cooper Loop, what's happening, buddy? Hey, good morning, everybody. Where the Teaser hell are you? Teaser free. Teaser free. Coop! Oh, Coop's sitting next to his antique phone again. I see where he is. <laughs> Do me a favor, Coop, real quick. Can you just pick up the phone and say hello, Mr. President? <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna get yelled at now. His wife's his wife's gonna be like, "Who touched the phone? There's fingerprints no, no, that, on it." That, that this furniture came from uh, my side of the family. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, hello, Batman. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm the one who's ain't all about the furniture here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like that in Coop's house that you just don't like doesn't get used or touched. It seems. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, stuff. it's like, you know, you have the museum rope, is what I like to say. <laughs> and then there's certain rooms you only allow in during Christmas. I mean, how many wow. ropes do you have blocking off certain rooms? <laughs> Actually, I don't have any, but it would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least your kids are all older now. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't that's imagine that kind of, because my house is like, my wife keeps saying, let's get, no, not till the kids grow up. The hardwood yeah. floors. They've etched drawings in their hardwood floors. I mean, yeah. you know, you just got to wait, you know. Yeah, we really do. I yeah. it's a, it's a good piece of advice. Got I mean, no great furniture, no great, because they're just going to destroy it all. They do. I had three boys. I could tell you that, you know. And they, they... So did you have stuff like this? Like, was the kitchen set or the dining room set up like that when your kids were younger? No, I mean, it was, I think we got this furniture when my youngest was about, like, eight. That's okay. still, that's still destruction age. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he was he was it was just at the end of that. I mean, it was we survived it. <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing is we had a, we had a party for my fortieth birthday, and um, someone spilled wine on one of these chairs. That 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 kind of just oh no, oh, yeah, you know, I can just see, I could just see the Crayola and chalk on those white walls <laughs> all, all over my house. <laughs> they love to the chalk those kids. I used to chalk up the driveway and stuff. Uh. So, oh, Coop, yeah. have, what's the scoop this week? We got lots going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I guess uh, let's let's talk. And Willie's in the house. I guess we'll talk about uh, it was a big announcement with Drew Estate this week. Um, and a lot of products were announced. So I think one of the uh, most exciting products that came out is the Undercrown uh, Undercrown Dogma uh, Sungrown, um, which is uh, a collaboration done again with the Dojo folks. But this is going to be a national uh, release for Drew Diplomat retailers. And it's going to be an amped up version of the Undercrown Sungrown, which is um, in this shape. It's going to be a five by fifty four box pressed. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan of the Undercrown Sungrown, so this is a very exciting release. Twenty four count too. Twenty four count, yeah. And they're also concurrently with that is uh, there's going to be another release of the Undercrown uh, Dogma Maduro as well. New packaging. New packaging and those pacata, pacata, patacas. I, I like those those boxes as opposed to the. Bundles. I really like those. What's what's the official name of those boxes? Tacos. I, I don't know. Tacos. Tacos. I'm asking. Okay. Tacos. Yeah. Tacos. I like them. Go. Yeah, I like those boxes. Um, they had them on. They had similar ones with the shady, and they really mm-hmm. really pop out. They look nice. So Willie, I imagine you were involved in the in the Drew Estate 
sun grown, the dog, the dog must sun grown. Um, yep. how, was it as simple as just taking that blend and, and putting a sun grown wrapper? Or did you have to work to make the blend work with a sun grown wrapper? So sun grown is, is its own blend. So the, the, the line sun grown, uh, I want to say that was the second cigar. The first was the underground shade that I did uh, after becoming master blend of the company. And then we, we came out with the undercrumb sun grown. And that's a whole new blend. That uh, I ended up using the uh, Sumatra sun grown wrapper. Uh, it's got the uh, Connecticut Stocko Habano binder. So what goes on the T52, what well, doesn't make the cut for the wrapper, the T52, that's what I used as a binder for this cigar. And then it's a, it's a blend of all Nicaraguan tobaccos. Um, but with this cigar in, in particular, it, it's an amped up version of the regular sun grown line. So it is the same tobacco, same. Got it. Uh, so this is more of a sun-grown cigar that was tweaked than a dogma cigar that was tweaked in the original broadleaf dogma that was tweaked to a sun-grown, correct? Yeah, that was a that was his own blend, and this one's based off of the underground sun-grown blend. Um, the the original dogma was based off of the original underground Maduro line, which was amped up and you know worked for for that size or whatnot. And then now the the dogma, it's it's off of the the, uh, the sun grown blend tweak for this size, and uh, you know it's it's a chunky, chewy, uh, meaty cigar like I like to describe them. You know, because it's just so much flavor. It's, it's it's so robust and spicy and smooth at the same time. And man, they're 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 good. They're good. Well, I know the cigar is supposed to land in stores in limited quantities across the country somewhere i think mid-august mid-late august um but they're having drew estate is having a vsse a, a virtual release party right um the virtual release party is going to be uh july 30th i believe it'll be a zoom event right. they'll be yep. shareable on facebook it'll be um july 30th i believe it's 7 p.m and uh, Smokin will be getting uh, the lion's share, the first batch and a lion's share of the distribution uh, due to their involvement with the original dojo conception. So that's just a nice little event they're going to make out of it. I think there, there'll be 200 boxes for sale, and we're going to tie it all up into a, a, a major virtual event. Some of the stuff that they're talking about doing in this event is really off the chain. We just had meetings on this. I mean, I knew about the dogma about a couple weeks ago. But we just had meetings on this yesterday, and I, I didn't get the the written notes yet. But there's going to be some major giveaways, or, and I don't even want to give it away. But there's going to be some major packages, major giveaways, some phenomenal major swag, major like unbelievable stuff. Oh, one yeah. of the one of the prizes I think they're only making five of ever. So um, oh, and cool. and it's pretty badass. So um, as we get more news, it's going to be released out there. But mark your calendars. Um, June 30th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I believe that's going to be the virtual lounge, and they're going to have a whole bunch of different packages. There'll be 200 boxes of the Dogma Sun Grown that'll be available. I'm pretty sure they won't last, but they got a whole bunch of other stuff for this event, and uh, I'm excited. I mean, just talking about yesterday, we all kind of got excited here at the office. I mean, this is, I think, is going to be a pretty epic event, and uh, once again, we're proud and honored to be involved in it, so very cool. It is very cool. Cool it's stuff. a big deal. It's one of those cigars that you know people go crazy looking for uh, when they get released, and and they don't last. So no. you got you got to get your hands on them quick. Hey, I, I got only doing fifteen hundred boxes in total. So I got one of these. Actually, I got a couple of these. These were this is the original release um, that from uh, I think it was two thousand sixteen. Sixteen, maybe, yeah. Uh, 14 or 16, um, but this is one of the original bundles, and you could tell because I keep telling everybody because this came out in only a brown craft paper two years, and the first year when it was released it had a square dojo commemorative logo, but the one after that it's round, and then after that they huh. came in they came in blue craft paper. So this is actually one of the bundles you could win in uh, Smokin's Drew Estate uh, Summer is Here giveaway. All you got to do is take a picture of uh, a beach ball that they had sent out along with any Drew Estate product. Post it on social media, tag Drew Estate Cigars and Smoking Cigars with your coolest picture and capturing Summertime is here. And they get that bundle of cigars along with an awesome Yeti cooler by Drew Estate and a barbecue cool 
barbecue grill from Twisted, Twisted Tea from the fine folks at Sam Adams. So it's a pretty cool promotion. But I, I don't want to crack a bundle because I'd really like to see how that cigar is tasting after all this time, right? And, and kind of compare it because I actually have a couple of the newer versions, you know, saved in. But one of these days I might just do a live video and take one from a couple of releases and just see how it pans out. That would be cool. That would that would actually be a really interesting yeah. uh, comparison. Just just so you know, uh, Drew Estate Social Media Extraordinaire, Jack Heyer, and uh, our marketing friend Joe Grow both said that it is um, the f- it was from 2014. Oh. 14. I thought I was right the first time. 2014. Yep. Yep. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Cooper, what's going on? What else is happening? Sorry, this week? I just want to clarify myself. Oh. I said June thirtieth. It's July thirtieth. Yep, That's what happens when it. I don't get the notes. I'm going by memory. But yeah, we, July. We, post, we posted it up on yeah, the screen. Yeah, clarify. July thirtieth, seven p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So there you go. Correct. Mark your calendars now. Uh, so, Coop, what else is happening in the news this week? Um, there was some other there was some other exciting announcements from Drew Estate. Um, they announced a new Deadwood uh, tobacco cigar, the Leather Rose, uh, which is going to be a Bellicoso. Um, they also announced a uh, Herrera Esteli Connecticut Broadleaf Lancero. Oh uh, yeah, that's based on the version that was out of Houston, which I have had a chance to smoke, and it's really good. That that one. So uh, that that's H Town. Yep. Store H- that yeah. had- yep. Okay. Yep. So yeah. is it the same cigar or is it a different cigar? Well, it's a, it's a, a more aged Lancero. Uh, so that blend came about. Uh, that I have the Herostoli TAA cigar, uh, which is the first time I was ever 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 able to use broadleaf because uh, we never really had enough, and everything we had was allocated for Liga Privada. And so when I finally was able to get the green light to use broadleaf on a cigar, the Harris the Lee TAA was born. And then when this opportunity came up to, to do a Lancero exclusively for, for uh, George's uh, store, uh, I went off of that blend, uh, the TAA Toro, and tweaked it and modified that to work in the Lancero format. And so the H-Town was born. Uh, and it was only available at that store. So I'm super happy now to be able to have that available now for all DDRP accounts and for everybody to get their hands on it. It, it truly is. It's, you know, the Herrera Habano uh, Lancero just did unbelievable. Um, it, it smokes so different from the regular line. And this Broadleaf, uh, it is, you know, again, it's a different blend from the Habano. It's a different blend from the Herrera Brazil. It's a different blend from the Norteño. Um, it's just, it's just really, really good, really good in the Francero. You really get those notes, you know, from that broadly, from that Brazilian binder, from those, those Nicaraguan fillers. It's, uh, it's another one of those, man. It's a thin cigar, but it's chewy. It's chewy. It's rich. It's spicy. It's sweet. It's smooth. It's balanced. It's just, it's just really good. Absolutely, and I make sure. Uh, and when is that going to land, uh, Willie? You know, I I want to say August, September. I want to say I'm not a hundred percent. Lucky for me, I, I I wear about tobacco and cigars. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't I don't have to really worry too much on the sales side. Uh, but I want to say it's August or September, maybe. Coop, can you verify that? Um. I believe that's the time frame they send. I'll, I'll wait for Joe Grow to give the uh, official word on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. So what else is happening in the news this week, Coop? Um, Steve Sock is at it again. Mm-hmm. So uh, he announced his new STFU sampler. Oh, I was, I've been obsessed with this. <laughs> you have been. <laughs> I, yeah, because I, I really like that cigar and the whole controversy behind it is has been obviously all over the place. Everybody's seen the social media reaction of Abe the first time he smoked it with me. But I, So go ahead and t- talk about it. So uh, for what Paul's talking about is there's been some controversy on whether the Sober Mesa Brulee, which is Steve Saka's Ecuadorian Connecticut shade line, um, ha- contains a sweetened cap or not. And this has been a debate, I would say, that's been going on for about since the release of that cigar. And Steve has taken the approach, and he said, or the position that says, that cigar is not sweet-tipped. 
Um, but it has generated the controversy, and uh, he's fed into the controversy, but he's still stuck to his guns. Do you have a personal stance on that, Will? Yeah, I, I don't think we've actually asked you this, Coop. Um, my personal stance is that there was earlier versions. The, the first version of that cigar was sweeter than the later versions. Um, I've heard some theories that some of the pectin that they were using was a little more sweetened, but I can't confirm or deny that. But I could tell you that That's I've what compared... I like about you, Coop, balls what? of steel. Okay, but what, <laughs> what, 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 I, what I can tell you is compare that cigar to uh, a sweet tip cap, uh, like side to side, and it, it wasn't as sweet. So all, all I could say on the matter is, is that I smoked one not having a clue. It was, it was even supposed to be any kind of a sweet cigar. I just thought it was a mild, creamy Connecticut cigar. And Paul happened to be recording me, and I just had a natural <laughs> yeah. reaction not knowing this. And it was a taste that I have become familiar with over the years with products that are sweetened with pectin. In it. And I called Steve ignorantly saying, oh, I never knew this was a sweet tip cigar. And, oh, man, did he trash me. Like, yeah. in text. Like, he just blew up my phone. I'm like, dude, I didn't know. I'm just saying. I, I just smoked one. I thought it was meant to be a sweet tip cigar. And then, you know, obviously, we, we talked about it. And, you know, it says that there is no pectin in it. So this will be one hell of an interesting experiment. So now he's so now he's got, in a, in the package, Coop, it's, a, it's the original brulee. Yep. It's a sweet tip, and it's a double sweet tip? Correct. And what he's doing is is there's going to be uh, five cigars in there, and at least one of each one of at least there'll be at least one of the unsweetened, at least one of the sweetened, and at least one of the double sweetened, and the other two you won't know what they are. Each cigar is going to have a, a band on it that says uh, S T F U exclamation point. So there'll be one with an S, one with an F, one with a T, etc. And he's not going to reveal which cigar is which until a Facebook live broadcast on September 15th. Yeah, and I mean, look, we've gotten beat up with calls about it already. People are going to want this. Um, I just tend to find it going to be difficult to really assess. Like, you know, he's had this joke, you know, either this would be the best or the worst idea. I kind of teased him and said this is going to be a Pandora's box because, um, you know, I've had those sweet tip pectin. Once you kind of get that, you can't get it off, you're saying? Yeah, if you smoke, what I would highly suggest to anybody doing this is to really not do one of these normal things that we do, that I do, when me and my team are trying blends. Like, we'll have six cigars lit in an ashtray, right? Yeah. And we're, we're, we're trying, we're going back. And I mean, is that how you, you do it, Willie, sometimes? Like, if we're trying to pick a blend. We go back and forth, you know? Yeah, and try definitely. It. But if you get that <clears throat> pectin in your mouth, you can't do that. You can't do like a side by side transition because yeah, they don't, it'll impact the rest of the cigars. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna have okay. to kind of give it a a day or at least a good few hours. Let your palate get all that stuff because it, it it sticks to your mouth. It sticks to your lips a little bit. You know, it's it's, it's a it's a kind of viscous sweet sweetener once it gets moist. And uh, Coop, if I'm not mistaken, the STFU is not the standard acronym we are all familiar with. Well, that's what Steve's saying. He's, it's, he's saying it stands for Saka's uh, Taste for Yourself. <laughs> and he's kind of taking a little liberty with the uh, yourself with the you. Right. So um, that's what Saka's saying. Um, I'll just say this. Steve, this is a brilliant move. He's, he's going to sell a lot of sweet tip cigars with this. And no matter yeah. what he says is about this being a bad idea. Right. This is Steve. He yeah, and it's you know so okay. it's so, people are gonna buy, these are gonna sell out. There's no question. I, listen, yeah. I did, I didn't say it wouldn't be profitable. Right. I just said I don't know. I just open up Pandora's box. Yeah. Yeah. He's. They're saying. I believe they said. Uh, it's gonna. The pack's gonna run. I think sixty dollars too for the five cigars. So not a not a terrible deal for Sober Mesa because they're not cheap either. Definitely no. not. So Coop, what else is going on this week? Um. So the other thing going on, I think we didn't mention, is Hoya de Nicaragua also has a line extension to the Cinco de Cadiz coming out. Um, that's going to be a Bellicoso as well. Uh, so Cinco de Cadiz is one of their most premium lines. It was released for their 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. And uh, the new size they've come out with is called El Doctor. 
Um, it's in honor of Dr. Cuenca, the the uh, owner of Hoya de Nicaragua. So, like each year when they've come out with these line extensions, they've they've named it after someone to honor someone in the history of the company. So this year it's Dr. Cuenca for that. Oh, fantastic! That's yep. a really good move by them. Yep. So, what do you got there, Abe? Speaking of Hoya, I do have this book. Uh, oh, it came in. Yeah, oh, great wow. book. Great book. Um, and um, this is going to be added to the prize that we talked about. The summer is here. Uh, social media challenge that we put on with Drew Estate uh, awesome. with the grill and the A-cooler. It's supposed to be signed, but it's kind of got this tissue paper seal around it, so I haven't opened it. So um, we'll find out if this was actually uh, signed or not, but it was supposed to be two signed books they sent us. One went in my uh, my museum shelving, and uh, the other one's going out as a prize. So. Uh, it's got a nice little carrying yeah. case. Yes, it did come with a nice little carrying case. <laughs> uh, Got to make sure it's uh, well protected at all times. So, Coop, yes. anything else happening this week? Well, I think the one last thing to talk about, I think uh, we could probably do a whole show on this, is um, I think folks heard that Kaizad Hans Socha uh, has stepped down as chairman of Gurkha Cigars, and the plan is uh, uh, he is going to be selling off his share of the company in the upcoming weeks. Really? That was not initially part of the uh, story initially. No, it wasn't part of the story initially, but the uh, Gurkha folks went on to a uh, town hall meeting the next day and or, or like later the day after the press release came out, and they did confirm that the that Kaizad is selling his shares of the company. You Did you happen to get on that town hall meeting? Yes. Was this something that was bought up in the town hall meeting? It was the whole purpose of the town hall meeting. Um, it, it, but let me say this. The whole topic was to address the Kaizad issue, but there was a question uh, from Boston Jimmy, uh, which was the first question. And he said, because the press release only said he was going to step down as chairman. So Jimmy asked the question, what does this mean for his ownership? And uh, the team addressed that from Gurkha. Jim Colucci, uh, Juan, and Christine addressed that right off the bat, saying their plans to sell it. They said they're, they're already on the way selling it. So we'll see what happens with that. Very well, interesting. Listen, there's a lot of people who that company employs who make livings there. A lot of good people. So, mm-hmm. you know, I I think as owner, that was probably the best move for for him, his company, and the people who work there. Right? People forget, you know, he's not the only guy who makes a living out of that. There's a lot of good people who work there, make a living every day off that company, and you know, we don't always get to choose, you know, the atmosphere in, in where we work. And I, I don't want to really delve into the context of you know his whole situation and and, and what he what happened with him but um i personally think it, it, it's 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 the right move at this point and mm-hmm. i think it's what's in the best interest for the many lives and souls who depend on that company for livelihood and, and let's face it uh i think i think a complete overhaul of the company and rebrand was kind of been overdue and for a while now so you know, hopefully, ho- ho- hopefully uh, the right things will happen there. And, and uh, you know, the people who, who need that business to survive and feed their kids and families continue to do so. Yep. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it was a very, very tough position. <clears throat> tough position. We, we haven't seen this happen in the cigar industry before. I mean, we've seen it happen, I guess, a little bit with Papa John's. Um, but we haven't seen an owner of the company being forced to basically give up. Not forced, but. He's giving up the company basically because of, of something very unfortunate that he said. Well, you know, every action has consequences. I try yeah. to teach my kids, you know. Yeah. And and sometimes even your intentions may have not been that, but you know, that's the way it goes. So yeah, we haven't seen that. And um, you know, we'll see we'll see what the future holds for that company. I mean, obviously everybody's kind of watching, so we'll see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a rough it's been a rough year for the industry, there's no question about it. It's been a rough year for the country, I'd say. Yeah, I'd say too. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, been so a rough far, year yeah. for the country as a whole. So we'll see. We'll see what the rest. Of- I, I think you muted your, your microphone, Abe. You just or unplugged it. yourself. <laughs> no, it's got there a switch. Go. I keep accidentally hitting it. Sorry. So, Coop, what's coming up on cigar dot com this week? Um, we got a review of the Gran Habano Reserva Number no. Five, two thousand twelve edition. The Romeo and Julieta Nicaragua Shade and uh, the Punch Chop Suey is also coming up. Isn't the Punch Chop Suey already done? Uh, it's the review wasn't done. <laughs> oh, no, the still, 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 still on his review. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were making another rendition of it. 
No, no. Well, if you did, you, you're ahead of me on that one. No, no. I, I thought <laughs> they, they, maybe they're fixing the packaging this time that will make you. Hope you seem a little subdued. Are you? Are, have you had a busy week? I've had a really busy week. Um, yeah. it's been a, it's been a very busy week. Yeah. So it was a it was a rough week for sure. Um, not just in the cigar area, but other things that have been going on uh, outside of that. Unfortunately, yeah. Well, we hope everything gets better for you. Yeah, it, it could be worse, is what I'll say. It's nothing that's, uh, but it's oh. just one that kind of took took energy from me this week. I'll just say. I'm just gonna give you a little tip in the future, Coop. Uh-huh. Maybe maybe get some background walls that you could actually kind of stand out from. You're you're a little bleached in there, bro. You need some sun, buddy. We gotta <laughs> yeah. get you, we gotta get you some sun. Yeah, I have been getting I have been getting out. Uh, it was funny. It's a. Uh, I've been uh, losing, you, I've been losing uh, you into the background of those walls every now and then. <laughs> Alan Rubin, who was in earlier in the chat room, uh, fake Alan Rubin, uh, he wanted me to get together with him in a cigar shop. I just haven't been really comfortable enough getting together in a cigar shop. I know my wife's not, my wife's worried about me going back into a cigar shop. Absolutely, but you can still get some sun. That vitamin D is good for you. All right. I've got a backyard. <laughs> Sit out there. I've, yeah. I have a palatial estate. He's probably got six You know what's funny? There. Everyone makes fun of the palatial estate. The backyard is like empty. It's like <laughs> a funny thing. It's just the backyard, like it, nothing there. Yeah. It's. It's six acres, but it's empty. <laughs> <laughs> a palatial estate. That's great. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, Coop, thank you as always for everything. And I'm thank sure we'll definitely talk to you next week. Keep up the good work and make sure you check out cigar-coop.com for all the latest news, reviews, and high-quality information about the cigar industry. Take care. Teaser free. Teaser free. Thanks, Coop. All right. a loop uh, if you have not checked it out, make Check it out. He's got great stuff and all the latest news on the cigar world. So, Willie, what do you got planned for the rest of the weekend, buddy? Dude, so two, maybe two and a half weeks ago, I wake up to about an inch and a half inside the water, inside the house of water. Oh, oh no. So uh, the demolition has uh, begun in the kitchen and uh, everything is sealed off because they have, they found mold and this and that and spores and all this crap. So I'm getting ready to start boxing stuff up. A throwing stuff away, uh, look for a storage facility, start moving everything out because now they got to remove the, the tiles too because there's moisture under the tile and the floor and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a disaster. So that and then start planning on a trailer to be moved in here to the backyard so we can stay in the trailer while this oh, thing wow. off for at least eight weeks. Yeah, it's gonna be happy it's, Father's it's Day. A mess. <laughs> exactly right. Holy cow. Yeah, could oh. be worse. Could be worse, but uh, yeah. So I got a, I got a fun-filled day of packing and going to the dumpster and finding a container, uh, a storage facility, uh, and <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't typical. know if I'm gonna find a storage thing or have those pods delivered here and just start filling it up there, uh, from from here from the house. So I don't know. I don't know, but definitely got a lot typical of typical Florida stuff. Mm-hmm. Typical Florida stuff. Was it from a leak inside the house, or did you? Was it from like the weather? Oh man, it was the hose, the water hose that feeds the refrigerator for the ice maker and the water dispenser. Oh no. So my kids went to bed. The last time they walked from one side of the house to the other to their bedrooms was probably around 930. And there was no water. So apparently right after that, it busted off the, the, the refrigerator oh, and it was spilling out water to about 8, 830 the following morning. Oh so when we walked out to the to the dining room, uh, there was a oh, no, that's the water worst. all over. So, oh. yeah, fun. Oh, man, that is awful. That is absolutely terrible. But, uh, hey, uh, that's what homeowner's insurance is for, right? Well, now, now, now you start that battle. You know, we already got our first thing from the insurance guy. I'm like, dude, that doesn't even cover a third of what we got to replace the drawer. Right. So, you know? That's always so, the that's always the worst part. We'll see what happens. Oh man, <laughs> best of luck, man. That is awful. I had happened to a friend of mine too. It was just months and months and months of just terrible. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, just of work. They're talking about you know at least six to eight weeks while they oh, rip off all this all the uh, the drywall and then they treat the house for the mold thing and. Then yeah, they, they, put they cut like four off. four feet of the drywall or three feet. They have to do like a foot above where they see the the water yeah, line. They yeah, they started off been through it. They started off with a two feet thing, and then they they still found moisture. So then with the three feet, they're up to like four feet now. Uh, in certain areas, other areas, everything, all the drywall you see, the, all oh, the 
in the kitchen. So, so now, he, now he's got a big banner that says Free Willy. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, also, at least the wife just stop bothering you about getting a new kitchen. <laughs> well, you know, that on, on the flip side, you know, she's happy she's going to get her new kitchen now. You know, yeah. I feel yeah. perfect. But uh, it's just, man, it's a nightmare of going through it. You know, where to put the refrigerator now? Where to move the stove? Are you going to be able to do an adapter so you can hook up the stove so you can have a stove? If not, we're either going to cook everything on the grill outside uh, or just order, you know, uh, we have these things called cantina. So you, you go to a place, whatever, that offers that, and they make your lunch and dinner, and you pick it up, you know, every day. And that's your meal for 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 that day and you know you do that every week or whatnot but so yeah we'll see we'll see we'll see what happens i know the house is a mess right now yeah well hang, at least you got some cigars to yeah get through it hang in there buddy oh man but whatever we'll see what happens. all bad times end so you know i'm hoping within eight weeks everything will be back to normal my house will be nice and spotless again <laughs> There you go. And I won't have this anxiety anymore. <laughs> <laughs> good, good luck, my friend. Good luck. All right. Let's see this week who belongs in a cigar insane asylum brought to you by CLE and Asylum Cigars. I miss not having the intro. That was like one of my favorite intros. We can try to get it. It's it's just difficult for me to do, but but we can we can try to make it happen. I got the audio file here. I can send it to you, Paul. So send it to me and Brian. So okay. I don't know what I'm about to read because all I know is I saw one earlier that Paul had sent like at 8.30 in the morning. I'm like, I'm not reading that. That's lame. <laughs> that was a terrible story, Paul. Terrible, 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 terrible story. So What was terrible about it? Because it? people got hurt? It, it was, was lame. It was just lame. Anyways, I'm reading this for the first time for everybody as I'm reading it. So here we go. This, one, uh -oh. this week's inductee really epitomizes the Florida man name. Deputies said they received a call about 23-year-old 23, 23 Lahoris Pickett Jr. at about 11.15 a.m. Wednesday from someone inside the T&W flea market in Pensacola, where witnesses reported Pickett jumped on a coin machine and was kicking and punching it and then went to the ground where he exposed himself and started screaming, call the cops, the dead are rising. Okay. <laughs> From there, he jumped on a customer's shoulders and attacked a worker who was behind the counter, grabbing her and then punching her when she pushed him away, records show. The deputy said he was chased out of the diner and went out in the parking lot, stripped naked, and stole someone's Chevrolet Sonic. But that's not all. That's not all. <laughs> I'm not even at the halfway point of the story. <laughs> yeah. At about 11.35 a.m., a call came from an elderly woman who lives a few blocks down who said that Pickett approached her in the stolen car, grabbed her hair, and tried to kiss her, and then picked up a piece of concrete and threatened to kill her, according to the report. <laughs> Deputies said Pickett then tried to break into an RV. Now watch some RV stories now, Willie. <laughs> break into the RV <laughs> on the property and ended up throwing a brick during a confrontation with a man who lives inside, injuring the victim. Pickett then, allegedly, ripped a mailbox from the ground, broke into a home, broke a TV, the report says. When the authorities arrived on the scene, Pickett tried to run, but he was found in the bed of a truck, records show. Along with his clothes, the backpack he left in the RV during the incident contained a throwing star. Was that like a ninja? Yeah. So a ninja star? <laughs> I don't know. Adam was adamant that we keep that in the story. I mean, he where did we even buy a ninja star? Throwing star, a handgun ammunition, and a bag of synthetic marijuana. And there you have it, according to the affidavit. Congratulations, Mr. Pickett. You are, without a doubt, this week's inductee into the Cigar <laughs> Asane Asylum. Which brings me to my next point, kids. Don't do meth. And the, stories, <laughs> the stories from the people who do that synthetic marijuana, man, it's like, it's like, it's like doing like PCP. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something up with that stuff, man. I mean, they're just falling off the deep end. Why don't they just get a prescription for the real stuff in Florida? Get a brownie. Get it over with. <laughs> Seriously. It's just too much. Who do we got on next week, Paul? Anybody? Next week, uh, um, Adam is going to be so excited. Look at him. Look at his face right now. It Booth? is our good friend, Mr. Matt Booth. Yeah, I figured. Oh, well, right. Cigars. The baby is going to be on next week. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be fun and interesting. Oh, yeah. I, I can't wait to see where he calls us from. Yes, and it's Father's Day weekend, you know, and, and, and you know, he has number two coming, I believe. What? I don't know if you were supposed to say that. 
I, I don't know. I, I believe I saw pictures of, unless they're old pictures, I, I through my Facebook feed that I saw pictures of Nikki pregnant. Maybe not. Then I could be wrong. I, I, just I talked, don't know. I actually. just talked to Nikki like a week ago. Uh, then I must have saw something old then. Why are you talking to Nikki? Because we were. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that weird? You're talking to your man crush's uh, wife. life partner? Yeah. Nikki and I are Is friends. it his wife? Dude, you are a strange dude. If you ever text my wife, we're going to have a problem. I'm That's just hilarious. You know. <laughs> Listen, if you ever text my wife, he's going to have a problem with her, not even me. <laughs> I want to, to say or do a thing. What could you possibly talk to her about? What do, you, do you ask her, like, what's what's Boofy wearing right now? <laughs> what did Matt have for breakfast? <laughs> yes. No, do you know what kind that. of coffee he drank this morning? For being so obsessed with him, do you do you wear any of his? Do you have any of his jewelry? I don't wear jewelry. He doesn't wear jewelry. He does have a big poster in, in the office where he works. I have seen that poster. I have seen that poster. Yes, it's an awesome poster. Well, Boofy's got some really cool new stuff coming out. We'll talk to him about as well on the on the jewelry side. The he's got some some really cool lines coming out right now, and and I think they're because they're back to work now. At, at his, uh, at his is it called a foundry where they make jewelry? Or, or at the factory where they yeah. make it. So he was pretty excited about that. And there's some new cool pieces coming out. And, and he's got some Father's Day things. So it'll be cool to talk to him. Because he definitely has some interesting lines, for sure. And I saw, I was watching Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, by the way, the other day. And Guy Fieri, I mean, there's no mistaking this one bracelet that he wears. With oh, no. The skull class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they have the guy the guy line, but yep. I noticed it the other day. I was like, oh, look, there it is. I'm going to – I got to remember I'm going to bring you some of the really cool custom pieces he's made for me over the years. Can you bring that – I'll bring all in? of them. I got I got a bunch. Yeah, I'm, I want to see – I've never seen it. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm actually talking to him about something, about something I want to have made. I'd rather have somebody I know do it. I mean, and his stuff, I, I like his style, so. Yeah, I'll bring in a couple of pieces. Willie, I want to wear that one day. You, you, you'd, you'd walk around like this. Yeah, I know. That's why <laughs> be, it would look so hilarious on the me. The chain and the piece is just so heavy. <laughs> it really is. We did that for the big delicious release. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty badass. Willie, thanks a lot for taking time out of your Saturday morning. Come on. I believe we'll see you again uh, July 30th. Will you be yep. on during the VSSE? I believe so, yeah. Perfect. I think you're awesome. Have the whole so, team. So. Good. Looking forward Should to it. Thank you for great. having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was awesome, Willie. It was a Thank good you. time. It's always a good time. You guys stay safe you and too, uh, happy early Father's Day. You too, my you friend. Guys. You All too. Right. Thank you. Take care. Absolutely. Thank good. you, Willie, for being here. Everybody out there in Facebook land, thank you for tuning in to KMA Talk Radio. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you missed any part of it, uh, go back to the Facebook feed and you can watch the entire thing. Till next weekend, as always, keep it lit. <laughs>